Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vago Maradian at the Pentagon, where we're meeting with Vice Admiral Chris Aquilino, who has one of the coolest call signs around, uh, Lung, who uh, is the N3N5 of the Navy, or the Deputy Chief of Naval Operations for Plans, uh, Operations, and Strategy. Sir, thanks for meeting with us. Well, thank you very much for coming by. Um, obviously, this has been a very, very big week for the United States Navy, but also for the Royal Navy and uh, and the Japanese Maritime Self-Defense Force. Uh, Admiral Takei, First Sea Lord uh, Philip Jones, and the CNO John Richardson signed a first-ever tripartite cooperation agreement. Uh, there's all sorts of, uh, of parts of this, but I want to start, why was this agreement such a high priority for all three of these navies? Well, I think the, uh, the benefit of, of this actual event uh, there are numerous benefits. The first is that we're continuing to execute the maritime strategy as laid out in our doctrine. Uh, the work with allies and partners, as we understand it, is critical, uh, and we are a better Navy and more effective when we operate with our allies and partners. So while this is the first time the document is signed, it is really an expansion of what we do every day. Uh, we operate with the Japanese each and every day in the Pacific, uh, we operate with our British partners uh, each and every day in the Atlantic and the Northern Atlantic. Uh, and what this does is really just move us towards a, a little bit of a more multilateral view uh, and continue to build interoperability uh, with, our prime, with our key allies and partners. What is um, the next phase? I mean, there are a lot of these agreements that look good, you know, when they when they first happen, but the devil's also in the details, and what are the deliverables? What are some of the specific deliverables uh, all three parties want to get out of this agreement? Uh, there's a few things we identified uh, that would take uh, this effort to the next level. Uh, I think it's uh, continued and increased uh, exercising together. Uh, it would include uh, engagements to the point of uh, staff interoperability. Uh, it could be exchange officers in different places uh, that, that lead to, again, enhanced interoperability, uh, and then potentially more complex exercises. So it spans the gamut. Uh, it was not tied to any specific event, but it really was what could we do together uh, anywhere on the globe to increase our uh, operations together. Um, our carriers, obviously, uh, would appear to be a very important part of this. Obviously, the United States Navy is the world's largest big deck carrier operator. Uh, Britain is getting two very large aircraft carriers, two 65,000-ton Queen Elizabeth ships, the first of which is going to come into service in a couple of years. And the Japanese also have a very aggressive plan to move up the carrier size curve, if you will. Um, how important do carrier operations, speaking as a naval aviator, but also as a senior Navy leader, how important is future integration of big deck carrier operations a part of this? Uh, carrier ops are central to everything the U.S. Navy does. Uh, that said, I don't believe this event at all was carrier focused. Uh, the British have decided to get back into the carrier uh, business and we are in support in helping them do that. Uh, but again, this event is not about carriers. Uh, it's about operations at all levels, from individual to large force. Uh, and I think that's where we're gonna try to get this going. Um, how much of this was messaging? You know, if you read the agreement, it kept stressing uh, that like-minded nations who want to maintain freedom of navigation in the region. Obviously, there are a lot of concerns about China and some of the actions it's taking, the island building, uh, the manufacture of those three artificial islands, uh, as well as some other moves that, that China's been doing. How much of this is messaging to reassure allies, but also deliver a message to Beijing? Uh, well, I think uh, anyone out there can figure out if, if, the, if there was any messaging. This is really about operations uh, and, as you said, like-minded navies executing the missions uh, that we believe we need to, maritime security, uh, the free float of trade and global commerce. Uh, so, again, I, I leave it to anyone who would like to interpret, but uh, this is what we've aligned in our strategy and how we intend to operate together. Obviously, the um, uh, you know U.S. Navy is is uh, the glue of uh, the U.S. forces, but the U.S. Navy plays a particularly important glue role for uh, the Western Pacific and in the Pacific Asia Pacific region. Um, do you foresee similar types of agreements, uh, or the three striking even broader agreements with other nations uh, in the region that are also like-minded and share some of the same concerns? Uh, I think there's potential there. Um, I think where we'd like to go, again, in alignment with our strategy, is for multilateral cooperation 
amongst like-minded navies interested in the same things we are, maritime security, uh, adherence to international norm standards, rules, and laws. Uh, and if there's a Navy that is aligned with us there, you know, we're ready to engage and uh, hopefully multilateral with other like-minded partners, uh, we can expand this initiative and that, that'd be desirable. Well, let me ask you one question about Philippines. Obviously, that's an important relationship the United States has had uh, for, for very many years, treaty partner. Uh, and yet the Philippine leader, uh, Mr. Duarte, was, Duterte was, was in Beijing and sort of said America's role is over and there's been a lot of rhetoric about getting American forces actually out of there. As the you know, ops boss, but as well as the strategic planner, um, do we know what you know, near-term ramifications there are on that, and what are potentially the long-term implications? Yeah, I think the Philippines, well, I know they're a, they're a key partner, uh, an ally in the Western Pacific, and I think they'll have to work through some of these uh, comments and, and figure out, you know, what their position is. Uh, we consider them allies and partners, uh, and I think uh, this political piece will have to play out. I think we're in a good place uh, on our mill-to-mill -mill engagement with the Philippines. Uh, what are some of your priorities in this job, and what are things that, that um, you know, either keep you awake at night or are things that are on your very, very, you know, tops on your very, very long to-do list? Uh, well, I have a few different roles uh, and high priorities that, uh, that the CNO has uh, entrusted me with. The first is to, to help him uh, and prepare him as a member, uh, for his role as a member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. So. Uh, I participate and prepare him for many of those meetings, uh, and it's beyond just being the head of Navy. Uh, so the CNO is a member of the Joint Chiefs, uh, and he provides best military advice uh, with the chairman and the other service chiefs to the president when asked, and we support that. It's an extremely high priority. Uh, secondly, uh, CNO has elevated the role and, and focus on strategy for the U.S. Navy. Uh, so. Uh, we are the lead in the effort to develop and, uh, and push Navy strategy so that we can end up in a strategy-based budget and a, strat a strategic view of where the Navy is and where we need to go. Uh, thirdly, under the design for maintaining maritime superiority, uh, one of the lines of effort is uh, characterized as uh, enhancing our regional, our relationships, and that's across a variety of areas. That's across the joint sister services, that's international partners, uh, that's relationships with industry, and it's relationships with think tanks and academia. So uh, I'm the executive agent for that line of effort and lead that for him. It's also a very high priority. And my team works is international engagement. Uh, so those four things uh, are they're all my number one priorities. Earlier this week, we spoke to the to the chief of uh, defense for Norway, Admiral uh, Håkon uh, Brun Hansen, and he was talking about the anti-access area denial challenge off of uh, Norway's coast uh, because of the Russians in terms of the bastion strategy, how quickly that's triggered, and some of the obviously longer-range weapons that the Russians are developing, both from a strike capacity but also from air defense, to put up. Uh, obviously an anti-access area denial bubble. The CNO famously recently wrote, you know, that it's time to retire that term. And it's it sparked a, a degree of debate about whether or not the Navy is trying to throw a basket, for example, over a very, very, very hard problem. How would you, you know, you, you know the CNO's thinking on this. W how would you characterize the thinking? And, and what are some, you know, do, do you feel that that's, you know, a fully understood challenge and problem? Uh, and, and if not, what are some of the other challenges and problems he wants you to spend some of your bandwidth on? Uh, so I think the view of uh, the overgeneralized term of A2AD is, uh, I think the view is it's just too overly simplistic. Uh, if I took you back to bows and arrows, you know, that was A2AD in its day. So the concept has been around for thousands of years. Uh, that gets us to, by talking about it in that fashion, it's overly simplistic. So uh, as we build our strategy and look for how we're going to operate against uh, threats that go in that direction, uh, CNO has pressured us to just think differently about it and come up with solutions uh, that are applicable for whatever the scenario is, and, and we're doing that. So, again, that's why you won't 
read anything out of our, any of our future strategic documents that, that reference A2 AD. Uh, it doesn't mean we're not developing correct strategies and operational constructs and plans uh, to defeat threats uh, that do not allow us to execute uh, our mission. Sir, thanks very, very much and look forward to talking to you again. Thanks, Barbara. Good seeing you.